So seeing a presence of a quorum, uh, calling the meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.05 p.m. Just a quick announcement for the committee that uh, Mr. Nakajima will not be joining us tonight. So we're it. <laughs> um, we only have a couple of items on the agenda for tonight. Um, one quick uh, housekeeping. Uh, the agenda says that we're going to be approving minutes of February 26th, but actually we'll be uh, doing that at our meeting on Monday the 11th. Uh, we don't have minutes for tonight. There's been a lot of meetings lately, so a lot of minutes that have to be drafted and prepared, so we're going to bring that back next week. Um, so moving on to uh, first order of real business, um, committee announcements. Do we have any announcements from the committee tonight? Okay. Um, and uh, we also have public comment. So if there's anyone here that wants to make any uh, comments, please come up to the microphone. You have three minutes to speak, uh, and please announce yourself. Absolutely. Andrea Battle, um, community member. Um, I'm a little concerned about, I wasn't at some of these talks and listening things because unfortunately it conflicts with other things, you know, and that's the way it happens in a small town. But I have a lot of concerns about the one approach, and that's what this is. Um, 600 is scary because 600 will be 700 within two years in a public school. It's been an observation. That's why schools all over the country are going smaller. The point, I'm, I'm very concerned, and people are starting to, I'm finding out, people are speaking for the community of color. There is no spokesperson for the community of color. I've been a community of color for 71 years. I could not speak for the community of color in Amherst. I know most of them, and we don't always agree. Okay, we're not a monolith. But as a teacher, retired teacher, Long Island Teacher of the Year, before I retired, against 10,000 others, um, I'm here to say this is this big is still a big school. I do think we should have been discussing more than one option together. That's one of the reasons I haven't been excited. I didn't want to create a problem, but I think we need to we may not be a, be ready for April. And if this is submitted after you voted on Monday, I think that some of us are going to submit something else saying that this is not a consensus. This is not, it's not that we're trying to block anything. I think we can do three schools doing the other two, and I don't think it's going to take 10 years to do it. Having looked over some of the things, some schools, have, districts have gotten it in one year or two years or three years. It's not impossible. I just think that we should not, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at these things, today's newspaper, the horridness of whatever. I go through some of these schools. My, my two grandchildren are in Wildwood. I don't see this. Okay, I really do not see, I don't mean that it's not, that everything is perfect and pristine, but it is not falling apart. They are not dying of disease and all kinds of things. And I think we need to really pull back and stop trying to make a deadline that may be impossible to form a consensus that quickly when you're only giving one main example. And that is my objection, is that I think we need to look at more than one point of view, and if not, some of us will probably have to get together and also send something to the Massachusetts School Building Association and say that we still think we'd like to look at other options and, and how we can work this out. And I'm really very concerned because a school of 600 is a little teeny, teeny bit better than a school of 700 for immigrant children, special needs children, many children of color and white children who just don't fit in to the scope of what a school is. And, um, and I'm speaking for them, and as, a, as an educator of 40 years, I really think bigger is not better. And just because we could have a zero, that would be wonderful, but we can make the other schools closer to a zero. It doesn't have to be. And we don't have enough figures to really submit anything, that real figures. And we need to do that. And all that money they spent on Fort River, and there's some really good ideas that came out of this. But I haven't even finished it all, and I'm impressed with that. So I just think that we really need to rethink this whole thing and maybe really have a serious consensus, because there's a lot of people that are very unhappy about the lack of more than one model, because I think we need to really think it out. And I think the state figured this out, because it was not an overwhelming mandate. 
and it's not going to be again. So just a food for thought for all of you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Yes, my name is Janet McGowan. I'm, I'm a parent of two Fort River graduates. Um, I went to two of the listening sessions, and I was concerned that there was only one option presented and very little information on that option. There was no information presented on the educational impact of different school sizes and school cohorts or the number of classes per grade. There was no information on how much it would cost. It, all we were told is we can't do, I mean, basically we're, the group was told we can't do, the, we can't fix the three, small, the three, have three schools because it's too expensive and it will take too long to fix the two. There was just no numbers and it just seems like a bizarre way to make um, a decision. Um, there was also, people weren't even told at the sessions that a school was going to close. One of the, either Wildwood or Fort River would close. And so presented with one option that sounded pretty reasonable and very little information was presented, you know, people supported it, but people had questions that weren't answered. I twice raised concerns about school size and cohort size because I think smaller schools work better for almost all kids. And Dr. Morris has said that schools of 350 to 450, smaller schools work better for at-risk kids. So that is a piece of information to me that seems important. It was not repeated back to the group. I'm not sure if you received it. Um, the leader of the, the listening session said, this is not like a survey. It's not statistical. It's just the people who came to the meeting are the people who gave opinions based on what they heard. It's not something you could say, oh, we heard X, Y, and Z. Um, the other concern I went is my two listening sessions that there were no people of color there you know, in terms of participants. And I thought that was sort of disturbing. And also sort of showed that there wasn't a real cross-section of the community and people, for whatever reason. But you know, there is a consensus. Everybody wants these Wildwood and Fort River fix. I was just in Fort River today. I would love to see a new roof. Um, everybody wanted to hear more information and be informed as part of the process. I think most people in our community want to make a decision based on facts and research and discussion. And I really do think we can work closely together. But I think we need to look at three options. I, I think let's go to the MSBA, say, here are the three options we'd like to work on. And we could have like a war of options. But that, that looking at the different options, including keeping three small schools, is going to make the decision at the end better. Or people can say, yeah, I really wanted this, but it was too expensive. Or it did cost more, but it was a better value educationally. And you didn't give the community that chance by presenting one option. So I really, I'd like to see a consensus to work together in an open way and move forward, not to you know, kind of cut out people from the conversation from the get-go. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? OK, uh, seeing no more public comments, uh, public comments is closed. And uh, we're moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, a conversation about the MSBA statement of interest um, process. Uh, we had this item on the agenda to give the committee an opportunity to reflect on the listening sessions that we've had over the past couple of weeks, uh, and also to give some time for superintendent uh, to talk through some of the things that we've been hearing um, in the listening session. So Dr. Morris, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then maybe we can go from there. Yeah, and I'll thank you. I realize there's not a microphone near me, so I'm not sure Amherst Media can pick it up. So I wonder if we can shift pass them down. Sorry, I'll think about it until I start to talk. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I think the, really there's only um, two things that uh, I want to talk about that I'm open certainly for any questions the committee has. So one is a visual that's you know both out there and, and here and on the on your tables, and one of the things that uh, you know I was able to attend three of the six listening sessions. I think that's right. Um, and one of the things that that I know came up at the three that I was at was. Um, how would a dual language program work within, you know, the proposed new building? So we tried to organize it visually um, because I recognize that um, a couple of things. One is that unless you're where I was last night with the many parents who have entering kindergarten students, they were highly attuned to what dual language programming looked like because they'd been following that process or hearing about it from friends or neighbors. But if you weren't connected to that, you might have read a, a newspaper article or two perhaps, but... Um, exactly how that cohort feels and looks wasn't necessarily uh, apparent. So I tried to muddle my way through explaining that uh, when it came up at the feedback sessions, but I thought a visual might be more helpful to describe that. So, you know, kind of front side looks since we've said, um, since I've said, 
you know, either K5 or K6 just shows how many classes would be in the dual language strand on the left and how many classes would be in the non-dual language strand on the right. And what it's trying to show is that uh, from an educational perspective uh, in terms of cohort, and uh, by cohort I mean groups of students who are sharing teachers who may be in each other's classes from year to year based on um, which strand they're in and who, whose teachers are working uh, very closely together, the dual language strand kind of by definition sort of limits that to two classrooms per grade level because those two teachers, one English, one teaching in English, one teaching in Spanish, will be sharing groups of students throughout this, throughout the class's educational experience in elementary school. And then the non-dual language, which again I hate the terminology for, we're still working and can't come up, I thought it was just clearer on this document, um, but we, we described it a little differently last night at the enrollment and registration event, shows that, you know, there's roughly two to three classes per grade level, which is kind of exactly the size of the cohort size of our current schools at Wildwood and Crocker Farm and Fort River right now, which all have between two and three with a couple exceptions in sixth grade right now, uh, classes per grade level. So I just wanted to create a visual or we wanted to create a visual to show that information uh, and maybe that would be more clear than some of the terminology that I was using um, at the sessions. It felt very, I felt like I was being very jargony and I try to intentionally not be that, but you know, I think visual displays sometimes can help with that. Um, so that's one piece I wanted to mention. Um, I think the second piece. Oh, I'm sorry. Just you want me to slip? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to maybe walk through? Sure. Uh, this yeah. Because it's actually yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you let me. Not here. <laughs> that's that is true. So um, so what you in looking at it, what you can see is, and I can send this to Amherst Media, and perhaps they can put this in the background. You all are so wonderful about that. So I'll make a note to myself to do that. Um, after the broadcast, or after uh, the show tonight, or the taping, um, is in the K to six school. Like if we're starting at that one, um, that the, in the dual language strand, there'd be 14 sections, two sections per grade level across seven grade levels. And so, if you're a student in those grade levels, you'd be in one of two classes that are working collaboratively together, um, all throughout your experience. So you'd be, you know roughly having half the same students in your class every year and there'd be some shuffling and those two teachers would be working very closely together as as al along with paraeducators and other related staff members and on the right side you can see the um, our current programming uh, which is which is primarily in English that strand there'd be two or three sections which is actually you know primarily Crocker Farm is actually very much like this now where there's a mix of two or three sections per grade level that would also be traveling that cohort would be traveling up sharing um, mixing with students in that cohort and having those teachers work closely and collaboratively uh, along that. So um, that the cohort size, because of the dual language program, uh, reduces the number of um, kind of the change in the student body that you're, the students have in class. So if you're, if you're looking at a, a school um, that would have, for instance, five or six classes per grade level, um, you're, li you're li not likely to have lots of continuity with the students who are coming and going just because the kids get mixed up each year from a placement perspective, whereas this is very similar to what we know right now. It's actually precisely what we know. On the back side, you can see it's a very similar, um, it's just K to five. It's oriented at a K to five level. Um, and in that level, there'd be 12 sections of students in the dual language strand and 18 sections uh, in the um, mo mostly monolingual uh, strand, which it has three classes per grade level, which is um, pretty much what Wildwood has right now. So it was just trying to, trying to show a, a visual representation of the student experience as they would go through the one of two strands within the school environment. Are there any questions for the superintendent on this before we move on to, is that okay? Or feedback. Dr. You know, so I wanted to bring it bo both to share with the committee, but also uh, as more and more questions that I asked, not just of me, but of you all, um, it might be a helpful tool. So any, it could be questions, but also I'm very open to feedback, trying to display sort of complex phenomenon for many in a simple way and, you know, open to making it better. This has been a question that's, that's come up repeatedly during the uh, listening sessions, but also even emails, yeah. uh, people, you know, wondering, I think, really good questions actually about what the cohorts actually mean, what the dual language program, what kind of impact it would have on a future uh, project. So it is an interesting way of representing, you know, visually what we're, we're talking about. Mr. Dumley? Um, so I think this is a good effort. Um, I think uh, this would be a good slide once you get into like the final format to put like for your 
presentation to the uh, the town council um, when you do that. Um, I, I think it could be improved visually. Um, like the first thing that I saw when I looked at it that came to mind is, okay, well, how many students are there then in each section of the school, right? And so I just, I'm, I just started writing the numbers down. Right. So like in K to 5, it's 240 on the dual language strand and 360 on the, the non-dual language strand. So having those numbers sort of called out, possibly also calling out the cohort number, because that's, when we talk about the small school experience, right, we're talking about um, your peer group so, uh, that is small enough um, to uh, encourage those long-lasting bonds, right, um, between peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-teacher and families as they move together. And so when you have three classes per grade of uh, with the average of 20, that's a cohort of 60, right? Um, so possibly calling that out. Um, I found the horizontal orientation of the dual language with the vertical of the non-dual language unnecessarily confusing. I, th I think you could maybe simplify that, um, as well as with the the rainbow of colors. I, I in gen generally I like rainbows for <laughs> school things, but this I think the colors don't really. Sign you already have the grades listed, so um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of picky uning here, but mm, for a visual, awesome. you want something that people don't have to decode or spend much time at all decoding. And so I think most of it is is uh, answering for yourself. What are the key metrics that you want to communicate, and then showing that as quickly as possible. Um, the uh, I think it's also a, a good jumping off point, and if you're on that slide, I think it's a good point to mention. So you got this dark blue circle around the, the dual language strand, right, that separates the dual language cohort from the non-dual language cohort. And exactly how that gets implemented in the building, I think, is a really interesting question. We've gotten a ton of feedback about saying, you know, I like the proposal, yet I'm concerned about X, Y, Z, and then bulleting item lists of, and I think that's a really good example where you can talk about where the rubber hits the road will be the details of the, of the, of the, um, of the proposal what, that the school building committee is gonna, gonna work out. And that, so this proposal is really, you know, can we get behind this idea? And that, you know, when you come to the table about your personal concerns about how we actually implement that for that small school experience, that's when that school bu building committee comes in. I think it's just a good opportunity to sort of broach that issue, which is key in a lot of people's minds. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. Any other comments or feedback for Dr. Morris? Ms. Spitzer? Um, so my only other kind of lingering question um, that has come up among others as well, related to this kind of um, two, two cohorts, is whether or not there would be separate administration. And I don't know if that's something we want to be commenting on at all now, but I'd love to know if you've got if there has been any conversation about yeah. that. Yeah, so that came up uh, at the, some of the sessions I was at, and I did answer it there for the group because it seemed like a factual question, in my opinion, that I could answer at least at this point. And what I respo how I responded was, we're not talking about co-located schools. So, because I think that's exactly. sort of what the question, as I interpret it, was kind of the unspoken element of it is this, is this, you know, co-located? And, and that's not what I'm suggesting. Um, and I think questions like that that relate to staffing would have to be worked out, you know, by the school building committee um, and the administration <coughs> as, as things develop over time. You know, I think I'd be uh, cart ahead of the horse if I start responding to specific staffing questions about that. Um, but does that mean we'd have the same administration for the entire building when we say we're not doing co-located schools? I'm just trying to right. just get it out. And sure. So, I mean, my answer is uh, I wouldn't make know. that determination right now. Okay. You know, that's not something that I've gotten, you know, feedback from staff, from the community on. Um, so it's nothing that I'd be ready <laughs> to kind of make a, a firm decision on um, because I think it's, you know, I'm trying to be cautious about, you know, it, it's really as an aside, and maybe this actually relates to other things that may come up tonight. Uh, it's interesting because as much as um, I'm trying to present this of here's, you know, a kind of tight idea um, with lots of un un unanswered questions like is it going to be ad reno, is it going to be new? Um, you know, there, there was some people who found that really satisfying and some people who found it really unsatisfying, like they wanted no, like we, we want to know whether you want it new or do you should it be a Wildwood, should it be a Crocker, you know, at um, Fort River. And so I think uh, for me, I'm trying to hold true to um, 
the the kind of five benchmark pieces and and I'll answer all questions around those around you know roughly the size of school and warm you know like those are things that I'm willing to comment on and and make decisions about at this point and I think I'm not trying to be rude to the question um, and I think I think it was actually well received yesterday but um, when it gets to that kind of granular size um, it's not something that I would and make a decision by administrative fiat um, at this point before that we know what the building looks like. We've had more intensive conversations with staff members uh, and our administrative team, and the administrative team has certainly talked about it. Um, but I do think it's a question that would have to be answered over time. No. Yes, sir. I, I just want to follow up because I'm still, I think if I'm a little confused about yeah. this, then there are members of the public who are confused. Right. So what's the difference between a co-located school project and one with potentially uh, I just want to know how, how, what's the difference between co-located and what we're pre presenting yeah. now? Because if I'm not, still not clear on this 100%, yeah. then I think then the public's probably not. And my assumption had been always that maybe it would have something to do with the way we administered it. But it sounds like maybe it's actually something about the physical space. But maybe, yeah. So I, I don't want you... I, I no, that I can answer I, super clearly. Okay, yeah. yeah. I would love Dr. That. Morris, yeah. please. So a co-located <laughs> school... We don't want any misunderstanding. Yeah, anymore. absolutely. <laughs> is two separate schools located in one building. A co-located yeah, school. Yeah, so when we talk about co-location, it's two separate schools, separate DESE codes, separate, you know, completely autonomous schools uh, that are located. I mean, there's some architectural elements to that as well, but it's that it's more, there's literally more than one school in one building. And when we talk about strands, we're talking about what we're doing right now at Fort River and all mm -hmm. the planning that we're doing. So we're not having separate schools, even though there's a dual language, there will be a dual language strand next year that starts, and there's a non-dual language strand that starts. So it's not that it's its own school, it's just an element within the school um, that from a student experience helps drive who your teachers are, who your classmates are, and some of the instructional programming <coughs> that happens in this particular case about the language of instruction more than actually the set curriculum. Um, so that's how I'd be distinguishing it when the prior project, just to, to cut a finer line, it was, it was literally building um, a model that would have two distinct schools that we'd already been t in conversation with DESE and the MSPA that would have had separate names, um, <coughs> completely autonomous separate entrances, all those types of things, and that's not what's in this particular proposal. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just, if I can, just Please. So, you know, I think it sounds, uh, I would imagine, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that having a, a conversation now about uh, staffing and administration uh, could potentially be triggering for some people or make them worried, right? Because, you know, we don't know yet what's going to happen in terms of who's going to be a principal or a co-principal or, you know, things like that. So getting into that level of discussion at this point when we don't even, have, we haven't picked a site, you know, we don't know if we even have a project right. uh, seems a little premature, even though I understand people's concerns oh, yeah. and wanting to, you know, to clarify that because I, I also heard that during listening sessions. Yeah, and, and the other thing I said that was perhaps uh, appreciated, at least by one person who told me that, uh, was just <coughs> that we have atypical administrative models in some of our schools right now that are on the elementary level and some of the other districts that I administer. So, you know, to make a, a firm decision without much more contemplation and discussion, and a couple years down the line, if we we're fortunate to be in this program, we'll also know a lot better about what it means to administrator a du administer a dual language program and a dual language strand within a school than we do right now. So we would, you know, for me, I would want to utilize that experience in making that decision that now we have, you know, we've talked to other districts, but two years from now we'll have, you know, essentially three years of experience because this year is like there's not dual language programming, but there's a whole lot of work going on into it that's going into it uh, that we would use to inform our decision. Um, so that's, that was the other thing that I shared last night, yesterday afternoon, excuse me. Yeah. Ms. McDonald, I want to give you a chance you, if you have any questions or comments for... On this mm -hmm. in particular? No. Okay. Uh, so I have uh, just a, a couple of, of quick, uh, I was looking at the grade K through 6 school. So grade K through 5 kind of makes sense to me, you know, the 12 sections and teachers for the dual language strand, the 18 sections and teachers for the uh, non-dual language strand, and then K through 6 sort of takes a weird turn. <laughs> um, so the dual language, you know, strand, again, 14 sections and teachers totally get that. Uh, on the non-dual language strand side, you've got 16 sections and teachers, actually fewer than the one on the K through five. So I was just wondering why there are fewer sections, if you can explain that, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and why that's different. And then uh, 
why the K and the sixth grade cohorts right. are larger than the two through or the one through five. Sure. Yep. So on the first question, um, in a K to six model, you have more students in the dual language program because of the extra grade level. Having sixth grade in the element is still in the elementary schools. So if we're capping the size at roughly six hundred, that's going to reduce the number of students on the in the non dual language strand. Um, because we're, it's a zero-sum game if we're getting to 600 and there's more on one side, there's to be fewer on the other. Um, to the point of why kindergarten, sixth grade, it was super random. Um, so much like our schools now, particularly at Crocker Farm and Fort River, um, they're sized where there's some years there's two sections per grade level and some years there's three sections per grade level. And so with the number of sections we would anticipate and the number of students, it means that some years we're going to have bumps, you know, and most we won't, but some we will, where... Um, Instead of having you estimate roughly 40 students, you have more than 40 and enough to make a third section. Uh, and in other grade levels, you have the more anticipated number. So um, Fort River and Crocker Farm are good models for this, where um, there's, there's slight variance based on, on size. And that for schools that tend to be in that kind of what I would call medium range, um, they're not um, <coughs> compared to other schools in Hampshire, Franklin, and, and Hamden County, they often have those, you know, they're sort of in between mm -hmm. grade levels. And, and our teachers are wonderfully flexible, and they make it work in those sites. Okay. So this could have easily just been uh, third or fourth grade. Like, it was just really just picking two grades just yes. to show that. Okay. And maybe kindergarten and six might sense. not be the, as I hear the feedback, it might be, people might think, why why the two outer Ring. So yeah. that, that might be good feedback to mix that up a little bit. Yeah, I think given what we've, the way we've talked about population and enrollment uh, changes in you know, trends in recent years, it almost seems like you would want to do that maybe in the fifth and sixth grade, show that larger class mm. size, you know, in the K through four, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and depending how school choice would work out, you might, you might, yeah. it might be beneficial to, to think about it that way. Yeah. yeah, no, that's really helpful feedback. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I don't see any other comments. Um, so, oh, Mr. Just, uh, just thinking about it, because um, <coughs> my head went immediately to what Fort River is today, because yeah. it's so, like, yeah. and in terms of the number of classrooms at each grade. So this conversation mm -hmm. is now sparking, so maybe there should be some attempt to show some variation on the K-5 diagram, too, because this is sort of presuming that we're always going to have... Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> three classrooms and when in reality mm -hmm. there might be some classroom some grades that have four and some that have two mm -hmm. right so um, mm -hmm. so it might be more sort of apples and apples um, if you do it that <coughs> way. Yeah. that's helpful thank you yeah, our current sixth grade, just to put an even finer point on it, so our current sixth grade is an odd, we have an odd enrollment bubbles around, so two of our schools have four sections and one of our schools, Crocker Farm, has two sections um, and pretty small size sections, so there is just some natural variance um, that the demographics show um, at any school size, so if Wildwood, that's our only grade level with four, um, but Fort River, which is our smallest K-6 to elementary school right now, has four in their sixth grade too, so mm -hmm. that, that's helpful. It's never going to work perfectly, you know, in terms of <laughs> cohort size. You know, that's the, they're children. They're not, you know, right, widgets right. or whatever that you get off right. an assembly line. So there's going to be unpredictability of enrollment. Yeah. So, Dr. Morris, is there anything else you wanted to share with the committee um, so, before we move on to the committee comments? So the question is whether it'd be more helpful for this kind of give and take between committee and me or whether, like, I don't know. I, I thought something going in the meeting, and I found the last 10 minutes really useful. So um, <coughs> I don't know if it's more helpful if there are clarifying questions that I might answer, since I didn't really answer. I mean, I answered some at the listening sessions, but there might have been other questions that came up at the listening sessions um, that because of the format, it wasn't really, we were listening. It wasn't that much answering. So would that format work okay? I know it's a little different than... Yeah, I mean, I do. Sure. I do actually want to make sure, sure that the committee has a chance because we, we, you know, presumably will be voting next week, um, and we did sit through these listening sessions for you know um, the past two weeks. Yeah. That the committee has a chance to share, you know, just some impressions and you know share that with the public. Yeah. Um, but I guess you know if there's some specific questions wrapped into your comments, we can also direct those to Dr. Morris or you know to each other. That's totally okay. Is that I see nodding heads. Okay. Um, so, is that is that okay? Yeah, that sounds right. great. Thank so, you. Donald, uh, maybe we'll start this way and, and see if you know what your thoughts and general impressions were. If you want to share those at this time, <laughs> not to put you on the spot. But. I don't like going first. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. Well, I'll I'll go first, and if, if 
long as it, like if new thoughts come as Absolutely, I'm hearing yeah. sort of everybody else's thoughts on that. But um, we do lightning rounds. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so I was I was lucky enough to be able to attend. I think. Um, I, I, I think I was lucky um, to go to all six of the sessions. Um, and so I, I found it actually really refreshing and a really um, great process for hearing from a, from a large number of people. Um, and I hear what the public is saying. I, I looked around a couple of times and, and noticed that there was zero people of color. So I share that concern. Um, I think um, that... In, in the short amount of time, we heard from a significant number of people, and then especially when we combine with the online survey. And what sort of struck me, and I haven't had a time to like really digest and synthesize, but um, just the, for the most part, broad consistency in, in what we were hearing. And there were outliers here and there. Um, but regardless, you know, each group, and I only, you know, could only sit in one group at each of the sessions, but... Um, heard some of the same themes across each of the groups. So in terms of the likes that I that I was hearing was they like the one building, we like the grade configuration and keeping K through six or K through five together um, and recognition that that may not be what everybody or what individuals thought was the, the ideal that, that they might wish for, but um, represented something that we could get behind. Um, and then consistently in, in the concerns, and we talked a little bit about sort of, you know, how does it work with the dual language? And I heard a lot of that. And is the dual language going to go away if we do this? Um, so heard that consistently. Heard some of the same things that people brought up this evening as well in terms of um, the size overall. But even, even more so in what I sensed throughout was this, Un the biggest concern is wrapped around this uncertainty, around how we're going to get to 600. Um, all the different ways that, you know, sort of seeing all the different options and then questions about what those um, might be in terms of impact um, financially, if we have to build new construction, does that end up meaning that we're actually spending more than we had hoped we would spend? Um, and then fear slash uncertainty about if we end up in that situation, does that mean we're going to end up with a bigger school and back where we started a, you know, a couple years ago? Um, we can't answer that, I don't think. So I, maybe that's a question back to you. But I don't feel like some, see, in some of these uncertainties and concerns, I feel like are, are sort of just symptomatic of being in this sort of gray zone that we're in right now, which is we're not defining an, a specific project. We're submitting an application um, to get funding to do a project. Um, and sort of my sort of takeaway and sort of hope is what I've been noodling since the last one is, is how do we continue to have these kind of conversations and um, feedback and iteration so that we answer the questions for ourselves and for our community um, members so that we, when we get to the point that we're actually starting to have to make decisions that are more concrete, that we've at least gotten to that comfort zone. Um, and you know, this is going to be a long and, and, and iterative process to answer and clear up a lot of that uncertainty. So I think you know, the fears and the concerns that I'm, and things that I'm hearing are really sort of put back to us to make sure that we're continuing to have these conversations and give and take back and forth with the community. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I talked about the, the, the size and concern, um, and then just also the overall size and, and worry that we're going to change our minds as we go through this process. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to skip myself for now <laughs> and uh, go to Ms. Spitzer. Do you have anything you want to? Sure. Um, well, I'd just like to say that um, I was able to attend two of the sessions, and I want to just start by thanking Anastasia and Allison for all of their really hard work, both organizing and working with the facilitator. I think um, I was one of the first people to kind of say, is it you know, possible for us to do this really ambitious thing of listening and getting feedback in such a short time frame? And I think it's imperfect. I, I think a lot of the criticisms we've heard tonight, you know, are true, but I think um, given the time frame and the goals we set out, I think we've done a really mm -hmm. good job, and I want to thank you guys for working so hard on this because it's a lot of work. Um, and then I'd also like to just thank everybody who came out because it was 
um, you know, I went last night and I went um, last week on, I guess it was Thursday night, not the snowy nights, but um, they were fairly well attended and um, people from different age groups were definitely there and then depending on the night, people from different um, um, groups within Amherst were there as well. So in terms of, you know, comments and questions that I thought were kind of trending and, and what I, I heard that was a lot of optimism and also a lot of um, fear also that we might be um, kind of re um, going back into a situation where a lot of people have a lot of strong feelings about the last project mm -hmm. and kind of this just concern of how are we going to, you know, once we hopefully get into the statement of interest, how are we going to make sure we don't end up in the same situation that we are currently without any active building projects? So um, I think we clearly, you know, need to continue the outreach and, and the, the listening. And it was interesting at the end of um, that, you know, last night at one of the tables I was at, somebody said, I think this is the right way to try to engage with the public, and we should be doing more of this at early on after we get hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, but hopefully we get um, into the statement of interest, um, our statement of interest approved. So I thought that was really interesting and potentially problematic as because we can't always be having a back and forth and, and we didn't have these listed as public meetings, but I, I'm trying to think of ways that we can try to incorporate more of mm -hmm. that back and forth and the listening that was able to happen at these meetings into our regular practice because I think it is often um, more productive. And obviously I, we're going to be engaging in surveys and, and, and trying to do um, outreach to those populations who weren't at the meetings last night. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think the sitting around a table is really uh, was refreshing after so much time kind of sitting um, in a row and, <laughs> 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 and, to talk to each other yes. and not being able to respond when somebody talks, you know, it, not being able to have a back and forth with the public comment. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to do it, but I think if we can try to build more of that into this process, I think it will pay off. Yeah. Well, just one quick thought on that. I think, uh, you know, a couple of years ago at this point, I think it's been two years now, um, almost two years, we had a uh, forum, a public forum, in which school committee, you know, was sitting still at the table. We actually did it in town hall. Um, but we had the community come and ask questions and, you know, make suggestions and all of that. But there was more of a back and forth because it was an open meeting and, you know, we were able to engage the public. And not every comment or question that was asked by the public was engaged by the school committee, but a lot of them were. Um, and Dr. Morris, you know, answered some questions. So it, it, I think there are ways to do that, but I think mm -hmm. it's a really, really valid point that uh, looking for more of those kinds of, of uh, moments where the school committee can engage more directly with the, the community, and the community seems to be asking for that as well, uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think it may help us not um, relive some of the mm -hmm. problems of the past. Yeah. Mr. Dunley, is there anything you want to say? Or? Yeah, so first just quickly following up on that idea. So I think we had talked actually um, a few months ago about the possibility in the future of potentially doing regular mm -hmm. forums, whether it's like twice a year or that we, that we, it was exactly how you said, uh, hearkening back to that example of the forums that had worked uh, really well. So, and I think, um, I think another theme that um, I heard uh, from the listening sessions in terms of engagement is, is just to, you know, try and use a cornucopia of approaches. It's not going to be one thing, right? It's not going to be the survey that is going to give you all public feedback at every point about everything, or it's not going to be one forum or one email, it's, it's, you know, a combination of these things. So what, to, to whatever degree our, our ragtag group of part-time volunteers that is the school committee can, can engage in that, it's good. Um, um, in terms of general thoughts, you know, so we're still getting, we're waiting for the, uh, the final report on the listening sessions and the online. So I don't want to jump to any major conclusions. I, I think the, one of the biggest things that, that struck me was the, the near unanimity on the need for compromise, which is different than do you support this compromise, right? I, um, I, I think the facilitator said at the beginning, um, so we all agree that something needs to be done. I think I would probably add to that um, nearly every, and this isn't just the listening sessions, but emails and individual conversations that this, this need for compromise, this acknowledgement that there has been a difference of opinion on, on what the community thinks is best, and therefore for a solution that actually is going to gain broad consensus uh, compromise, and I think I remember a few months ago when we first started talking about this, there was maybe a little bit of 
trepidation about using that term because it it can sort of suggest that there used to be conflict. And I found that most people I talked to are like, yeah, there used to be conflict. <laughs> it's like people are very comfortable acknowledging that there was this was a significant point of division in our community for a long time, and people engaged on it pretty intensely. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and pretty intensely. And so. The need to find, to craft, to come together and craft a practical compromise, as opposed to I'm going to come with what I think is best and you know duke it out. I, I think overall that was the most encouraging feeling that I got um, from both people who supported and, and didn't support the past project. Um, I, uh, I want to thank community members for staying afterwards. I was able to have like some good one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, particularly with some people who um, didn't support the last project, and I was just sort of trying to get a gauge for what their concerns were. Um, and I think one thing that might help us, um, a point that was very helpful to clarify is that what we're asking for right now is uh, people to support a solution that meets the guidelines of this proposal. Can we, can we get on board with this in principle? What we're not asking for specifically, either from the public or from the town council, is a firm commitment to vote the final project that emerges from the MSBA. Project because what I heard loud and clear is okay you know you say K five K six six hundred and you know we have this built in cohort the dual language program but how is that actually going to manifest in a building right where does the rubber hit the road and we've we've gotten some emails um, that I think have been very helpful in this regard uh, sort of endorsing the theme of the compromise but saying but you know it's what's really important for me for the public engagement process is A B C and what's really important to me to implementing you know the small school experience is XYZ and so um, I, I think that's it's important to it's an it's important reassurance safeguard to, to communicate um, because what I sort of see happening here is that you know we get in and then we've the school committee and the superintendent and the town council we've made this promise right we've made this public commitment to uh, implement um, to the best of our ability this this compromise and this framework and I, I cannot imagine that there will be any shortage of people in the public who will be holding us accountable. And I would, I would empower, and I would even say I would encourage people to do that. And that's what I think is really going to be what firms up the commitment. Like, so this related question of, well, you say you're committed to K5, K6, which sounds like a nice concession, but are you really, you know, just, are you going to change once your thinking changes? And I think... Um, in addition to our publicly stating it and voting, a, <laughs> making a formal vote in support of it, um, I really think that, that that public attention and engagement is what is going to firm that commitment. So I, I think that's a, a reassuring thing to, to focus on. Um, my one sort of question for Dr. Morris and what, what thoughts you had on this is, you know, so say we're engaging this process, good faith effort, and um, this question of how you get to 600, right? Um, let's say, you know, we through our best efforts, bending over backwards, every stone unturned, and it just so happens that all those options don't pan out. We we currently think that that's not going to happen. That we still have a high level of confidence that we'll we're pretty darn sure we can get to 600, which is why we went to this level of effort to put it in the proposal. Um, but you know, even the wisest can't see all ends. And so, what if that happens? Could could you maybe just talk about process wise and describe? For the public, what that might look like if if we were to get to that place that we don't think is going to happen, but but could cause some concern for Dr. Morris. You want to answer that, and and then I'm going to just have a couple co quick comments, and then we're going to move on to just a different uh, part of the agenda. But go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually a relatively brief answer, um, <laughs> which is that you know we'd be transparent and engage the community, and right, and that would be the school building committee, and then the school committee, and myself, as I see as the key players in sharing. You know, we've explored these options, we've studied them, and we don't see any viable options. And being really transparent with the community, as you know, a lot of the feedback I, I think we all we all heard about process and transparency throughout, um, and then re-engage both the MSBA and the larger community about what's the route to go. And again, I can't for forecast exactly what turn that would take, but what I think, uh, what I can commit to from myself, and, and I don't want to commit for others, but I think it's consistent with the ethos that all of us are talking about in a future school building committee would, is to be communicating to the public, you know, we got to this place, right? There's, frankly, institutions in our town that got to um, really hard spots in the middle of building projects in the last five years, and I think the best thing they did, the one I'm thinking of, is they actually came back to their community and said, 
we can't make this building, the science center work where it's designed, you know, and I think that level of transparency, I don't know everything, I just know what I read in the paper, but I appreciated that it was a public statement where this far in, we have to detour um, because of their unforeseen things um, that we couldn't have known at the front end of it. Um, and now there's a new science center that I got to be in last week. And so I, I do think there's, um, there is, you know, the, the honesty and candid transparency in the, that's built into the process is part of, um, part of what we would do. Excuse me, Dr. No, please. I thank you. Why don't we take a recess? No, no, no. I'm so sorry. Right? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. So we call the meeting back to order. Um, we just had a short recess, and a committee member um, had to, to leave unexpectedly. Um, but we still do have a quorum, and we'll continue this uh, agenda item um, at 6.54 p.m. Right. So, Dr. Morris, sorry to interrupt. I think you were in the middle of, of responding to a question and a comment. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else that you want to add to that. Maybe I'll just rephrase it slightly yeah. uh, more succinctly, which is that I think the transparency that that we would have um, throughout the entire process. Um, you know, the question was around a pretty major detour, but there's going to be detours that are not perhaps as, you know, significant. And I think what we what we heard, what I heard over the listening sessions is a desire that if we were to get into, if we're fortunate enough to get into the MSBA process, that there would be built into that process uh, a communication plan that shared with the larger community, engaged with the larger community on any major issue and even any, any kind of, What's major to some person, one person might not be major to another. So really so that uh, people had access to what was happening, decisions that were being made well before they were made, and input throughout the process. So mm -hmm. I think that's my kind of general answer is that um, there's always going to be twists and turns. There's going to be things you find out that are unexpected. But the big thing is making sure that the public has, um, has ways to access and, and hear and offer feedback on um, the twists and turns that are ha bound to happen. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I actually had uh, a couple of comments from Mr. Nakajima, who's not here obviously tonight, uh, but he wanted me to share with you. Um, so <coughs> I think overall uh, what he's expressing is very similar to what I've heard other committee members express tonight, uh, which is uh, you know, primarily the, a clear sense from the public that overall they like the superintendent's proposal and they strongly believe that we need to address both schools as soon as possible. Um, Mr. Nakajima says that he heard a general comfort with the size of the school, uh, particularly in light in, of the launch of the dual lo language immersion program, um, which creates something approximating two discrete learning communities, were his words. Um, he also heard a strong endorsement about creating a child-centered design that is safe, nurturing, and provides access and welcome to students of all abilities and backgrounds. Uh, there were many questions about how exactly we do that but a general recognition that the specifics of any plan uh, will come later. Um, and I think just to, you know, to add and echo probably what I've heard as well, I, you know, I attended all of the listening sessions um, also, and I think generally speaking heard uh, mostly people feeling like this was a compromise and that they felt that um, they could come together around this idea. You know, there were definitely a lot of, of questions that came out when, you know, there was uh, four framing questions that were uh, shared with the groups. And the third framing question was uh, just asking, you know, if there was anything that people needed clarification on, if there was, you know, additional questions that they might have that might help them better understand. And that's when we heard things like, you know, uh, what happens to the, you know, the students, um, you know, we currently have around 750 enrolled uh, in K through six. Uh, what happens to the extra 150 if we have a 600 person building? Um, you know, there were questions about uh, administration and, you know, how we're, we're handling cohorts and all of that. But generally speaking, what I heard was people saying, well, you know, we're willing to uh, move forward with this application and then want to make sure that we're staying engaged and that we're getting answers to these questions as we move forward. Uh, which to me says that people are understanding that there's a feasibility process that, and that that feasibility process is what's going to determine a lot of the answers to these questions. Um, you know, I think that there's going to be continuing uh, concern around the 600, you know, person school. And I think there are definitely people in, um, you know, in the community that feel very strongly about not having larger schools. 
and we're going to continue to hear that. And so I think that is where the point of pressure will be primarily for you, Dr. Yeah. Morris, but also for the committee, just to, you know, to be able to uh, come to terms with you know, how we create a educational learning environment that feels warm and child-centered and nurturing if there are more students and what many people feel comfortable, you know, with. And, I mean, I constantly hold in my mind the fact that we have these buildings, Fort River and Wildwood, that are very large buildings that were created <coughs> to hold, you know, over 600 students and at one time held close to 600 students. Oh, yeah. um, and so, you know, clearly there's a history already here in the community for that size of a school. And, you know, having personally come from urban schools that had many more students than that, I also know what it feels like to be lost in a sea of kids, right? And, you know, and, and how that can be uncomfortable and, and uh, you know, throw kids off, right? And students off, especially in the younger grades. Um, but I also don't, I personally don't see at this point um, another alternative for us, given you know all the conversations that we've been having. But I, I was generally, um, I guess, heartened by the you know that most people the, the words that I kept hearing over and over again were you know reasonable compromise, um, and people felt that there was this very strong sense of urgency, and they were glad that we were doing something. That it felt like there was some action and there was some movement forward. Um, so while we don't have all the answers yet, and while there's definitely going to be continuing concern, I think, you know, to answer some of these questions, um, you know, it, it does feel like the community is, is at least at this point, you know, sharing uh, generally where they are, and, and that, that, that feels mostly positive, you know, and that they're mostly, mostly supportive. Um, I think Mr. Dumling is right that we have not received yet the, you know, the emails um, from the feedback form. Uh, I wanted to make sure that the public knows and that also the committee is aware. We talked about this during listening sessions, but we will be getting those reports. Uh, one report from Dr. or excuse me, from Mr. Logue, who was the, the person who was hired to facilitate the listening sessions. So he's actually been compiling all of the notes that were taken during the listening sessions, as well as the email responses that we got from the feedback form. Uh, Dr. Morris has also shared with him the responses that came from the teacher listening sessions, the three listening sessions that took place a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there was also a neighborhood association meeting that took place that was independent of our listening sessions, but also very helpful, uh, that took place in District 1, I think, on the 17th of, uh, of February. And that was, you know, the, the those uh, responses were actually gathered and also shared with us and shared with Mr. Logue. So he's been, you know, he's got all of that and he's sort of pulling together uh, this report and expects to have something for us by tomorrow that we can take a look at. Um, simultaneously, I know, Dr. Morris, you've been working with the facilities director with, um, you know, with Rupert to pull together a draft SOI and have that shared with the committee as well tomorrow. Um, is there anything that you want to say briefly about that? and? Sure. So um, the technical parts um, involve some updating just because we have, you know, since the last time we applied, we have more air quality test reports. We had the roof <coughs> report. We, you know, we had more reports that we wanted to integrate, um, you know, into the, um, the statement of interest. We at least wanted, I wanted to hear um, tonight a bit of where the committee was, and then I'll report that back tonight to Mr. Roy Clark, who can then integrate um, some of the consensus pieces for your consideration, um, but we didn't want to do that until you hadn't had a chance to deliberate on this. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the reasons we didn't have it ready. We had the technical part ready tonight. It was the other part that we needed to hear more feedback from the committee on before we finalized, but we'll make sure that's available tomorrow. Do you feel that you've gotten the feedback that you needed for that? Okay. I think, yeah, I think so. Thank you. Great. Um, I just want to go back to um, the the staff listening session. So I know um, one of the other questions, sort of in that question about what more information would you like, and there, I heard consistently also yeah. that people would like to hear what more about what the teachers, staff mm -hmm. in the buildings are thinking. So I think we we need to figure out a way to get those notes. I know that not a lot of people attended those um, staff sessions. Yeah, or about no? forty five total. Oh, forty five. Yeah. So making sure that that's available and easily found um, by by people in the community that have had these questions and really want to understand from the faculty and um, and staff perspective what it's yeah. like in those buildings and what their perspective is on this application. Um, 
And I think the other thing, this leads sort of to something else that I've talked about a couple times with individual, I can't remember, you and, but one of the other th things that I noticed and, and connected was a lot of the questions um, really relate to information that's already out there but not easily found, right? So we, it, mm -hmm. we, so many times we heard where, you know, just where's the feedback form and, and even finding it. And we think that it's pretty simple to find, but um, a lot of people had trouble finding it. Um, but also information about stu um, student population projections and, and um, other, the, all of the feedback that we've gotten through the last eight months or so um, <coughs> from teachers and staff in the buildings just in public comment sessions and things that we've been discussing at, at the meeting. So it's something, I, you know, there's no answer to that, but it's a, a, it's a key thing that I think as we go forward, it's not just having the, and, and engaging the community to hear and, and um, get input on the process, but it's also sharing information as it's produced and, and learnings along the way. I was thinking about it as you talked about that other school yeah. district experiences. It, that only can work if if that information is easily accessible and easily found by yeah. people who want to find it. Mm -hmm. um, people who really want to find it right now can find it if they invest a lot of time and energy to, <laughs> to digging it, myself included. But we want to make it available so that people who are curious and want to inform themselves and don't want to invest a lot of time so that it's easily found um, and easily understood. So I, I think that's a key thing that we need to also noodle is how do we... How do we address that going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would absolutely agree with that. I think um, you know, over and over again, we kept hearing from people. Again, that fr fourth framing question was, how do we keep people engaged? You know, how do we, it, you know, if a, if a project actually materializes and we actually uh, do find ourselves with state aid to build a school or renovate a school, um, you know, how do we make sure that people know what's happening and uh, you know, allow them to get answers to their questions, right? And one of the biggest challenges, I think, that's that you know, it, it, for understandable reasons, uh, but that the district has encountered before, is in, you know a lack of ability to share information as it comes up, and you know, and to have it someplace that's easy to find, as as Ms. McDonald said, um, you know, so it's something to to think about. I think moving forward, how do we create a project space? that maybe is even separate from the arps.org website, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, that maybe, you know, is, is on a separate platform um, that's linked to from the arps.org website, but that is easily accessible, you know, for social media, that, you know, is more user-friendly, yeah. that is mm -hmm. less clunky. Yeah. Um, there's so much content right now yeah. on the arps website, right, and people have to dig through layers of, you know, calendars and all the, you know, the different announcements and all that kind of stuff, and people do tend to get lost very easily with that. So that is something that I think we need to, to think about because it, it does actually create a sense of, uh, <coughs> of chaos and uh, confusion if, you know, people can't find information, you know, easily accessible. Dr. Morris? Yeah, I think the other thing to note, I agree with everything that's said, but um, is that I was really glad we had a, a quite a wide age range um, at the sessions I was at, and to not only rely on um, websites and mm -hmm. electronic forms of communication. So, uh, some, that was something I heard loud and clear at least two of the three sessions that I was at, that um, I, it's not to disagree with anything that was said, but that can't be the only medium that is There were utilized. a lot of, of recommendations, yeah. I think, for, you know, town-wide mailers, yes. for um, all kinds of, yeah, I yeah. think that that's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was helpful to hear yeah. directly mm -hmm. from people um, who said, however accessible it would be on the website, that's actually not where they would go to gather information. And so um, I agree with what was, was shared before. I just wanted to add that one piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this item will come back on, on our agenda at our meeting on Monday. Peter. Mr. Demling? Uh, I'm sorry, um, I forgot to ask. Um, so I haven't attended any of the meetings, but we have this building facility use, master facility use study going on. Yep. Um, and, and I don't know what the status is, but it has a potential touch point with this, with this discussion uh, because part of that is the feasibility of sixth grade to the middle school, which is one of the potential options for getting to 600 and. Um, and just, uh, I don't know if you had any update on, on, on that and what, what, what's been shared there. Sure. So um, just thinking through this for a second. So 
Um, it's a regional. It's a regional group, uh, but I do feel like it's it's all the information that I'll talk about is publicly accessible on our website. So I feel like it's fair for me to. It's relevant to the conversation and fair for me to say. I just want to double check as I think about it. I think maybe just mentioning where that information can sure. be found. And sure. If, if that's. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a little cautious of mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we don't have a quorum of the regions, so that maybe makes it easier. Um, but so if you go to district initiatives, um, there's, a, there's four listed, and one of them is, is the regional master use facility board, or it has some, I don't know the exact term, but it's something along those lines. And it shows visuals of what a 7 through 12 consolidation would look like, including the scope that would be needed. Now, this is not the final product, but this is where the group is a couple meetings in. And then also uh, our most recent meeting, which was Monday, Tuesday? Tuesday. Monday was snow day. Thank you. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, which looked uh, primarily at uh, or exclusively at what would it mean for sixth grade to be in the middle school and what the scope is. So I think the best thing I could say probably without tripping anything is it's publicly accessible. Um, the scope diagrams are very clear in terms of major renovation, minor renovation, code upgrades are no change at all. Um, and that final report we presented on March 26th um, in this building at a regional school committee meeting. But I think it, it, if there's particular questions, pe anyone, you know, you all or members of the public can get in touch with me. Uh, but I think the diagrams do clearly explain, you know, what costs might be present. Is that, I mean, I, you can tell me I can go further. I think I just, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I want to be a little cautious You're skirting about very carefully, and yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I just don't want to. Yeah. You all mixed up in OML stuff, so, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so we, uh, what, I, what I was going to say before is that we are, um, we will be back here on Monday um, to review this, this item, and it will be a vote, um, unless the committee decides that they don't want to vote, but I'm hoping that we, uh, since we've had so many discussions already, that we can move to a vote. That's what's on our agenda anyway. That's the only item on the agenda. So um, we will be here at 6 o'clock on next Monday uh, to discuss this. And I think in the meantime, the public is, you know, continues to be welcome to uh, share their thinking their, you know, uh, via email. Uh, contact Dr. Morris uh, if you'd like. You can also contact the school committee, school committee at arps.org. And uh, we're happy to receive any and all thoughts and questions uh, from, the, from the community. Um, okay, so Dr. Morris? So the other thing I was going to say is, um, nope, actually I'm good, never mind. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is actually not the only <coughs> item on our agenda That's tonight. Right. We actually have uh, two other items. The next one is Acceptance of State Bilingual Education Programs Grant. Uh, so, Dr. Morris, do you want to fill us in? Because we don't really have a packet. Um, yeah, on the back, there's a little description, there's but I think I'll do that. I'll do that <laughs> orally. Um, so it's unusual when we get a grant from Desi for the school committee to have to approve it. What's a little unique in this particular um, situation is that we it is a it was a co-authored grant application, and it's a co well, it's not. We are administering the grant for both our community and the Holyoke Public Schools. Um, that's working wonderfully well, and it's been a really nice collaboration. But because it is a multi-district <coughs> collaboration, our legal counsel advised that it come for a school committee vote. And certainly, you know, if you don't feel comfortable voting tonight, we can we can uh, push it off. Frankly, we're mm -hmm. in the weeds of the grant, you know, in a good way. That we're we're, we're actively looking at curricula. Uh, we're working with Mabe. You know, we're doing some partnering with Holyoke, um, but most of that is actually sort of on parallel tracks since they already have two programs up and running. Um, but because it is an interagency grant um, that we would bring it to the school committee, um, it's not something we, we haven't talked about. We certainly shared it with you. But the wrinkle of the, um, it's not co-administered. It's administered by us financially. Our business office is managing it, you know, you know in collaboration with Holyoke, but that's the way these grants go. So, um, you know, the we're framing it as a grant that we would look for you to accept. And as part of that grant, um, that you it would um, authorize me to execute the agreement with the Holyoke Public Schools. So I'm sorry about the legalese that comes along with this. Great, no, that's yeah. that's wonderful. Um, and Dr. Morris, so the three hundred thousand dollars that's of the, for this grant um, is that shared equally with Holyoke, or is there some other kind of arrangement that's been made? It was based on need more than equal split. It happens that it's roughly an equal split. It's not exactly down the line. I, I don't have the numbers off my head, but it's, it's, it's certainly within a pretty narrow band. Um, but for instance, in our situation, we're um, dedicating 
uh, funds. We have multiple Spanish classes, as you know, going on that are funded by the grant, and Holyoke has one. So we, we're spending more on Spanish courses for our educators than Holyoke is, and in some other areas, um, they're spending more based on their needs. So uh, none of it's wildly different, but uh, we also, when we were, when the grant was being authored, it was trying not to force artificial constraints on either community to say we have to spend exactly the amount the same amount on Spanish courses because it didn't even our vendor right you know so we're working with GCC that's Holyoke has HCC and other vendor that are right there so you know we tried to like have the same themes and goals and and many of the same activities but we didn't try to lock ourselves into everyone has to go with Greenfield Community College because um, from geographically it doesn't make sense for Holyoke um, so it's roughly an even split though. And this is a pretty competitive grant. It was. It was only two awarded. Right. So out across of, the state. Do you know how many communities? I do not know. The other one was also a partnership grant in the eastern part of the state, um, but I know they had more than two applicants. They were um, clear with us, but with, they were excited about our partnership. They worked themselves closely with Mabe, so they were pleased that Mabe was a kind of unofficial co-sponsor with us, but certainly involved in the grant, and they're excited about more dual language programs uh, in the state after the Look Act. That's, this is what they were hoping for. And, and part of part and parcel of the Look Act was sort of an encouragement that this is a highly um, advantageous model for many of our learners, and particularly for our learners that are underserved in the Commonwealth. So um, they wanted to support that implementation. That's great. Yeah. I know that um, this was uh, announced at one of our previous school committee meetings. Um, so this is just an opportunity to, to go ahead. Mr. Dunley. I was going to make a motion. Please. Uh, I move to accept the FY19 State Bilingual Educator Program Grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the amount of $300,000. Okay, we uh, have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. And uh, any further comments or questions? Dr. Morris? So, I'm sorry, it could, it could be done as a separate, but the third bulleted point, it could be done separately or it could be done in conjunction. Sorry, I should have said that before a motion was made. I wasn't. Um, just that um, because it's it's three hundred thousand dollars, it's also acknowledging that we are not accepting all, we're accepting all three hundred thousand dollars, but we're administering it and splitting it with in conjunction with. So all should the, the motion read differently? Is that um, is that what you're suggesting? I think I think it'd stay as is. Um, it would just mean that we I'd ask for a, a separate motion around the third bulleted point on the agenda after, which is no problem. I just didn't know how you want to do it. And I'm complicating matters greatly <laughs> as I hear myself <laughs> say this. So we want to get this right. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. This is yeah. a technicality. Yeah. We shouldn't mess it up. Um, yeah. But I think so, it's fine to stay as is. It would just require another motion after. Ms. Westmoreland. Yeah. Um, Sean, Mr. Mangano yeah. actually spoke to me about this yeah. earlier today, and he said for the second piece that you could just say basically what's written there, that you authorize the superintendent to execute the agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we'll have two separate motions yeah. just to make it nice and clean. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So all those in favor? Okay. Passes unanimously. And the does it, somebody want to make a second motion? I'll, I'll so move to authorize the superintendent to execute the agreement with Holyoke Public Schools. Great. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, Dr. Morris, anything else you want to add? <laughs> <You> Sorry. <sure? laughs> <laughs> okay. Want us to split this motion, too? <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? All right. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Congratulations again. This is yeah. such an incredible uh, gain for the district and for Holyoke Public Schools as well. And I, for one, am incredibly proud that we're partnering with uh, their district. Yeah. I think this is going to be a really incredible program. Yeah. And we'll have more to share, I guess, as a segment of school committee planning um, uh, at the April school committee meeting. We'd like to do a more full update as to where we are with staffing, with enrollment, with registration. You know, it felt like March 19th is a little early. It's right before our enrollment. And, um, but we'd like to actually come back and, and not just do the updates, but a more full, complete mm -hmm. update for the committee. That's great. And I think yeah. at some point it'd be wonderful if we could invite, uh, you know, a representative from the Holy Oak District or a couple mm -hmm. of representatives mm -hmm. to come up and, That's you know, um, mm -hmm. maybe talk through. We'd have a dual language program focus for, you know, part of the agenda. Uh, and talk through some of the work that they're doing and how we're collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, just think like there's an opportunity here for the community and for others to learn a lot from, from this experience. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love great. that. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so next item on the agenda is school committee planning. I'm not going to go too much in depth in this because we just talked about the meeting that we're having on Monday, um, and that will be just a one-issue uh, item. Uh, and then we will have our next full committee meeting on the 19th, um, which will be at the town hall, at Amherst Town Hall, again, just to, to try that out and see how that goes. Um, 
Is there anything else for school committee planning, Dr. Morris? Uh, no, not from my end. <coughs> okay, okay. Thank you. All right. So I will take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Mr. Dumling, thank second. You. Second. All those in favor? Excellent. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.